You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, Foundry Church, welcome to worship. As we dive into the Word of God today, um, one of the things I want to, you know, kind of talk about, well, you know, before I do, I should at least acknowledge today I'm a husky. I'm always a little husky, <laughs> but anyways, um, so today I'm a husky. I had, I had had a parent ask me when I wore a, a U of M, go blue, hail, um, zip up the other day when I preached, they're like, would you wear a different college uh, sweatshirt or t-shirt? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And uh, a gentleman brought me a sweatshirt. It's a crew neck, the ultimate awesome dad sweatshirt. So um, I'm wearing this and apparently it's a loner. I don't get to keep it. So if you see somebody else wearing it, that's why. But if you have a college you want me to endorse and they're not a, a lunatic bastion of socialism, go ahead and send it to me and I would happily wear uh, their, their sweatshirt. Or if they have a good football team, I'll back them. So um, yeah, that's just a small plug for higher education. As we dive in today, uh, we're going to talk about vision. And when we look at vision and we talk about this, uh, this concept of the eyes of our heart, that's not something we talk about a lot because... Honestly, in, in thinking eyes of our heart, it, it's, it's very much a Christian concept. I think it's a Christ concept. So when your eyes are confined and your vision is narrowed to yourself, you often make misjudgments, right? When you're thinking only through your lens and only seeing you first, uh, y- your vision gets very narrowed. You see a very small picture of what's going on in the broader landscape. You miss so much. Um, One of the fun things that I did was I I took a little bit of time and I looked up like selfie fails and some different things like that. And people are majestic in their failures. With these little devices, if aliens ever invade us and see like what we've done to ourselves with this, they're going to, it's just going to be a mockery because there's this one uh, article I was reading and I watched a video of this woman who is walking in a mall and she's like furiously texting and she goes head into a fountain. (laughs) That woman popped out of the fountain. So like she was soaked and she gets up and she like walks off and uh, she interviews the next day and she's like, do you know what it's like to have millions of people laughing at you? I'm like, oh my goodness. And she ended up suing one of the major news networks because they showed it over and over. But she was, she had her vision contained right here. She didn't see a massive, and it wasn't a small fountain. It was huge, and she missed the whole thing. There's videos of people walking into poles, right? They're just texting away, tank, and they walk right into a pole, to which I'm like, hey, I love that kind of stuff. It's fodder for my laughter, but the reality is when our vision narrows, we can miss what is not only right in front of us, but all around us. When our vision gets really narrow, there's, there's articles of a young man who, who fell into the Potomac River because he was taking a selfie while it was flooded and he had to be rescued out of the Potomac. A kid was hanging off a bridge in Dallas taking a selfie and he falls and he was all beat up in the hospital. He survived, but there's stories of people whose vision gets so self-oriented that they actually do themselves harm. But it's not just individuals that have this. We can look and know that when an eye, the eyes of an organization turn inward towards self, that it can get, um, it can get septic, and it can get emotionally and spiritually ill, right? Have you ever been part of an organization that gets sick in its own bones because it only feeds and looks at itself? And the reality is like one of the great stories that came out of the early years of Youth with a Mission was when Mercy Ships was starting, they had this ship called the Maori. Um, and the Maori is, it's actually a native word, uh, a word for the natives of New Zealand, the Maori peoples who do that awesome haka dance. But anyways, it's a different story. Um, but they had this ship called the Maori and they were wondering the leadership of YWAM, what to do with it. And so they took Um, a 24-hour period, and they prayed about it. And one of the leaders of YWAM said, came up and shared a vision God had given them. And there was a vision of all the people in the organization with their eyes on this ship called the Maori. And off off to the side was Jesus Christ. And he was completely ignored and left out of any conversation. It had become about a ship, not about the Savior. And they got their eyes inward. What should we do? Who are we? We, we, I, I. And all of a sudden, they found Jesus on the outside. And it grieved them and broke their hearts. They ended up losing the ship, the Maori, to follow Christ. 
Now, eventually, mercy ships came into being, but they had to learn that hard lesson first. Today, we're going to dive in to Luke chapter 18, and we're going to read some stories of Jesus Christ helping people get their vision right, and people who want to see maybe a little bigger than we do. Join me as we read Luke 18, 35 through chapter 19, verse 10. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. I love that. It, yeah, I just love that image. Like, be quiet, and he shouts louder. You know, it's like a, a dyslexic listening. He, he would not be quiet, and he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped, and he ordered that the man be brought to him. When he came near Jesus, Jesus asked, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to see I want to see, and Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight, and he followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they began to praise God as well. Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. Remember, tax collectors were the Benedict Arnold, the turncoats. They were Hebrew people who worked for Rome, so they weren't well loved. He was actually deeply hated, and he was the chief tax collector, so he was the head of the line of people we don't like um, or they didn't like, and he was very wealthy. He had extorted money from the people of God, and he wanted to see who this Jesus was. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd, which I love that, right? He's just like, excuse me, pardon me. He was, he was a little fella. He had a Napoleon complex, right? And, um, and he, he, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus Christ since Jesus was coming that way. Do you guys remember the song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. It's funny, a wee little man was he. Yeah, he climbed. I went for the high note there. Um, and, you know, he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, right? And and you have this 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 thing going on where it was Zacchaeus, this little guy, is, is climbing a tree to get a look at Jesus when he, when he saw Jesus coming that way. We'll pick up in verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up at him and said, Zacchaeus, you come down, because I'm going to your house today, but I don't think he sang it, but that's what we did. Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus climbed down the tree at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter to themselves, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Jesus welcomes him back into the broader family of God as being a son of Abraham, a Hebrew. And Jesus goes on to close this with, for the son of man, came to seek and to save the lost. So let me ask you a question. Do you want to see? Do you really want to see? Because the blind man and Zacchaeus tell us a story of people who really want to see. They want to see something. They want to encounter Christ in some way and Maybe they're just not satisfied anymore with the the physical blindness or, you know, for Zacchaeus, maybe he was tired of being on the outside of the people of God. He wanted to see faith from the inside. We don't know, but the question for us is very basic. Do you want to see? Do you want to actually see? And I love the question of what the blind man said to Jesus. Not the question, the statement. Jesus, son of David. What an interesting thing. Obviously, Jesus' reputation had grown by this time. And he was known in some way as a messianic figure. But Jesus 
is walking by, and the blind man says, who is it? Who, what's going on? I can't see. Tell me what's going on. And somebody says to him, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. And instantly, this guy does the genealogy in his head of who Jesus is. He knows he's a descendant of the great king of Israel, King David. And he knows the prophecies about King David's sons ruling forever, the messianic promises. promises and he cries out, Jesus, son of David. He cries this out, and it's like he sees something everybody else is missing, the true identity of Christ. And Jesus says to him, what do you want from me? What would you want from me? And he said, Lord, I want to see. I I just want to see. I think there's a physical reality to it, of course. He wanted to see, but there's also this spiritual reality that maybe he doesn't realize he's tapping into, that he wants to see. Jesus for himself. And maybe let Jesus get a look at him and do some work in him. And and the question for us is, do we really want to see? Do you and I really want to? When we look back earlier in this chapter, we, we read a story, and it would have been in your devotions this past week, in the devotion book, Seven Weeks with Jesus, you would have read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, right? And then there was this other story of the rich man. And the rich man comes to Jesus and he does everything he can to get Jesus' stamp of approval, right? He talks to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus talks him through the following of the commandments and the rich man proudly boasts, I've done all these since I was a youth. I've got it together. I look good and I should be approved of by you, Jesus, But really, he didn't want to see, the rich man didn't want to see anything new. He wanted, well, in my opinion, he didn't really want to know Jesus. He wanted Jesus' approval to be part of what his many possessions were. He wanted to collect the approval of Jesus Christ, but he didn't want the conviction and transformation of Christ to be part of his life. He didn't really want to see the brokenness in himself. He wanted Jesus' approval on a shelf in his life as a way to validate him and, well, be a part of who he is instead of having Christ be his true and new identity. In the end, he didn't feel a need for transformation. He didn't feel a need to be, well, to see himself as Christ saw him. No matter how good he was at the law, he had failed and he was sinful, and he needed redemption. He didn't want to see that. He wanted approval. And the reality for us is that we, like the rich man, don't see our own state quite often. We don't look and not only perceive, but admit our deep need for transformation. And the rich man answers the question for you and I, do we really want to see limited We want to see something of Jesus. We want his approval, but quite often we shun his, well, his conviction of his Holy Spirit, the call to die to self and live in Christ, to take up our cross and follow him. We see that the rich man lived in this same tension as you and I. We want just enough Jesus to get into heaven and be approved of, but not so much that it wrecks our everyday ordinary life. Right? We want to keep the things that, well, maybe are hidden things, but we don't want the things that would transform us, convict us, cause us to take part in repentance, where we have that dig step and we turn the other way from sin. I believe the rich man answers the question for us we don't want to see. Because in the end, when he was called by Jesus to sell his many possessions and to follow him after he gave away all he had, the man left sorrowful and sad. He was well aware of what the God was in his life. He was owned by his possessions. He didn't realize that they owned him. He didn't own them. So do we want to see? I don't think we always do. And that's why we invite the Holy Spirit to give us, well, open the eyes of our heart. Help us see what we can't understand or perceive. Help us understand and see what maybe what God is doing to draw us near to himself, but in drawing us near, he transforms us into the image of Christ. It's a costly thing to see Jesus for who he is and the work he's done. So let me ask you this. Can you see your need? Right? Can you see your need? 
I think um, sometimes when we, when we have this situation, there's so many ways where we can't see our need because well, what's going on in our life, we're so occupied with what's right in front of us, we miss the greater picture, kind of like those people texting. But we, were, we were talking before the service here about people going down mountains in cars and riding their brakes. They can't see that coming out the side of their tires, if you ride your brakes too long in the mountains, they start smoking, you know, and they don't know that they're burning their brakes up. And they don't realize that, that what's happening in, in the back end of their car is going to greatly affect what happens to the front end of their car when they hit the runaway truck ramp right? Because they burn up their brakes, but they can't see what's behind them. They're not paying attention. And the reality for us is we have to ask the question, can you see your need? Can you see your need? I think this is where the story of Zacchaeus is so accurate into our life. Zacchaeus clearly saw his own inadequacy. He knew he would never dunk. You know, I picture the guy at about five foot flat, you know, just trying to, I mean, he's a guy, and, and in, in the ancient world, in antiquity, there, men were shorter back then, but can you imagine that he just, he was this little guy, he couldn't see over much, he was always staring into the, to the back of someone else, be it male or female, he was the guy on the bottom, right, he was the shortest, and the reality, as you look at it, is he saw his own inadequacy, he, in, inadequacy. he knew he wasn't tall enough to see Jesus, which I think is interesting. He knew he couldn't get the right angle to actually get an eye on Jesus. So instead of asking someone to put him on their shoulders like a four-year-old kid, right? Have you ever done that at a parade where you're standing there and you see and all of a sudden somebody puts their child on their shoulders and you're like, well, I'm not nine feet tall, bro, you know? And you you had your blanket saved on Main Street in Zealand to, to get a spot and somebody puts their kid on their shoulders. And that's what Zacchaeus always had. He knew his own inadequacy. He couldn't see Jesus. But I want to put Zacchaeus into a a little bit of a modern context. Imagine somebody walking in wearing like a Burberry suit that costs like seven grand. A really nice Burberry suit, a nice blue Burberry. You open it up, it has the awesome Burberry plaid, and you're like, oh, that's Burberry. And they look so good. They've got the Rolex right? They just look well put together because they're, well, they're wealthy. They have this this status. Now picture them being about yay tall, right? So the suit's been tailor-made because, you know, your inseam is seven. You know, it's like little tiny legs. And, And imagine this person in this Burberry suit walking in, trying to get a look at something, and then going straight up lumberjack and grabbing onto a tree and just like, and bearing their way up, like climbing up in a Burberry suit, climbing a fig tree. You'd be like, well, that's not something you see every day, right? You never really see that. Imagine seeing somebody in a a $5,000 Burberry suit shimmying up a tree and then like scooching out onto the branch and being like, and looking down, I mean, you look up in a tree, sometimes you'll see a kid, right? And you're like, oh, hey, there's a kid in a tree. Not that, you know, nobody's going to be shocked. You look up and see a guy in a $5,000 suit, you're like, that's weird. That's it, right? That's just not normal. But, but he was wanting to see Jesus. He understood his own inadequacy. He knew he needed Jesus. He knew he needed Jesus. And this is what I think is so interesting. Zacchaeus had this inner longing for Jesus, and he would do anything to just set eyes on him. And I think that's, that's fascinating because his motivation seems similar to that of the rich man. But the reality that we see in this is that he needed Jesus and he was aware of it. But unlike the Pharisees, Unlike the Pharisees you read about this week, he stands in total kind of a juxtaposition. Zacchaeus who would do anything to get a look at Jesus and because he needed him, and Pharisees who would look at Jesus in order to judge, critique, and find a way to justify why they didn't need him. I love the, the kind of difference in the separation of Zacchaeus and the Pharisees. Jesus, earlier this week, we talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector. In your devotions, you would have had the Pharisee and the tax collector in there. 
And the Pharisee and the tax collector are on the Temple Mount and they're praying their prayers. There's this Pharisee who's standing there. And again, picture a really nice Armani suited guy just standing there very nobly. He's like, thank you, God, that I am not like one of these. Very high, very noble prayer. It sounds really good in his head that I'm not like one of these. I fast. I give 10% of everything I make. I pray and I'm known in the public square. Right? He, it's very confident. And then there's a tax collector who's on his knees beating his chest saying, oh God, forgive a sinner such as me. Do you see, there's one who sees themselves in light of Christ, and there's one who sees only themselves. They see only themselves. The Pharisee sees only their self, and they, he was so focused, the Pharisee in this story was so focused on himself, he didn't even see how much he needed Jesus. That's why I caution anyone in this place who feels that they are in good standing with God based on your own behavior to revisit that topic, but get Christ in the view. Put Christ into the view and get yourself out of it. Because when we find ourselves so satisfied with who we are, we forget how quickly we drift. How quickly we drift from following Jesus Christ. We, we move away from him rapidly in order to exalt ourselves. So here's what I would invite you to do. To be like the blind man and call out to Jesus. To call out like you're well, like you're afraid, right? Like when you, when you can't really find the people you love. Think of a kid playing hide and seek. We played hide and seek one day, the other day with our kids and uh, like Ethan was, was hiding and then uh, Erica and I, it was terrible. We kind of snuck off to the side and we watched him. And uh, we went over to Lincoln Elementary and played in the dark because that's terrifying. Like a playground at night, I'm like, this is where bad things happen. But anyways, we, we sneak off and we heard, Mom and Dad, right? They start, they start calling out because they can't see. And when we call out to Jesus, we can call out to the one who was promised to us in the Old Testament, the son of David. Jesus isn't an afterthought of salvation. He was always the plan. And we can call out to the very son of God and say, Jesus, son of David, son of David. And he will ask you, what do you want from me? The question lives in Scripture for you to answer. What do you want from him? And it will reveal the treasure in your own heart, the thing you want most. But I believe this, that when we call out to Jesus and we ask for the same thing the blind man did, Lord, I want to see. Maybe we could just ask him, Lord, will you let me see what I need? Show me what I need. If you're the author and perfecter of our faith, which Jesus is. Show me what I need in order to be made perfect. And we invite the son, of, the son of David, Jesus Christ, to come and convict and transform us. And the next thing we do is we climb up. We get over our own ego. And we chase after Jesus at any cost necessary. We may find ourselves on our knees, begging God in prayer, to speak to us. We may think that's a lowly position, but so was the lowly position of a man who had to climb a tree to see Jesus, but he would do anything to get his eyes on Christ. So should we. We shouldn't be comfortable with someone else's definition of who Jesus is. What did he look like? I can't see. Find any way possible to get your eyes on Jesus. Do all you can to climb up. Remove yourself from your surroundings. Remove yourself from your surroundings to see the one who came to redeem your life. So the invitation for you and me is quite simple. We call out, we'll climb up, and then we realize the ultimate reality of our sin is this. We have to drop the viewfinder. But I don't want to call it a viewfinder. It's a viewfinder, right? I don't know if you remember these. You guys remember these? Yeah? When, if you're a child of the 70s and 80s, this was the first iPhone. You put this little disc with a bunch of images in it, you put it, and you're like, oh, new picture. Oh, it's like a movie, but really slow. And you'd watch it. The problem is, I think for many of us, we have a mirror in it, and we're just looking back at ourselves, going, oh, it's the U-finder, right? 
We got our eyes so squarely on ourselves that we miss the opportunity to see and know who Jesus is. So the, the challenge to you, the challenge to me, is to get over ourselves, to get over our possessions, because we don't possess them, they actually possess us, to get over our ego and to do the very things that we see most humiliating. Call out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Climb up to get a view of him. Do whatever you have to do to get away from the distractions and find Jesus Christ, you and him alone, because he wants to come near, and he wants to pull you into the family. So you got to get yourself out of the view. We've got to get us out of center stage and get Christ front and center of everything so that in our lives, he is made famous. Yes, we will decrease, but to the glory of God, he increases. And we become a transformed reflection of the one who died for us. The challenge to you and the challenge to me is to be very cautious about our own Pharisee living inside of us. The self-satisfied, self-assured Christian who thinks they have it together. Because far more like Zacchaeus and the blind beggar are we. We're so much more like them. People in desperate need for Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of this life. I invite you, move beyond yourself and lean into him. And find out what it's like when you say, Lord, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart. I promise you, he will. He'll show you things in you you never wanted to see. But the wonderful gift is, not only does he show them to you, he also provides resolution. He provides resolution so that when we see these things, we can confess, we can repent. And that brokenness gets transformed into his image. Thanks be to God that this salvation is not by, by our own work, but by his And the continued work of becoming a disciple of Christ is trusting that when he shows us the brokenness, he intends by his own blood to restore it. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the ways in which you work, that you speak into our minds, you speak into our life, you speak through your word, and you call us to really choose one of two paths. The path of broken humility that calls out to see you, that climbs up to see you, or the path we choose for ourselves of self-exaltation. So God, we ask, humble us. Break us from our own ego that we may see you and in seeing you be transformed into your image. God, help us be people who know what it is to confess, to repent, and then experience new life in Christ, even as you have remade us in your image. Thank you, God, for the gift of salvation in your name. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.